My friends, I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. This is a Sunday of paradoxes. On the one hand, we celebrate with grand feast Jesus Christ as King and ruler of the universe. Yet our gospel reading takes us to the passion narrative in which Jesus stands before Pontius Pilate, stripped bare, beaten, and looking anything but a king. In some sense, our tradition struggles with this tension. We want to declare Jesus as king, we want to declare him as ruler of the world, yet Jesus reveals him nothing of the sort. When you and I think of kings, we often think of grand rulers who rule with might and power and who are often aloof from the rest of us. Yet here we have a man who empties himself totally and completely for those he loved. The Hebrew people often wrestled with kingship. If you know your biblical history, God never intended the people to have a king. We read in the first book of Samuel, in chapter 8, the people begged for a king because they wanted Israel to be like other nations. They wanted to be like the rest of the world, but God did not want them to be like the rest of the world. God wanted Israel to witness to God's glory, God's gift of life and blessing in this world, and to entirely depend upon him for their life and well-being. But the people kept going back to Samuel and saying, Give us a king. We want a king now. When Samuel goes before God and says they wish a king, God says they will regret it. It will not be good for Israel to have a king. But God grants their wish. And in fact, if you want to read the rest of the Old Testament narrative, the people struggle and wrestle with the fact that the kings often fail to live justly and righteously. Even the great king, the King David, the one who we heard the choir sing about in the psalm, even he fails to live to God's call to proclaim righteousness, truth, justice for all people. What ultimately redeems David is that he repents of his sin, and for that he is exalted. Jesus is proclaimed as Messiah, the anointed Son of God. And this was problematic for the people of his time and probably remains problematic for us as well. Because in the Jewish understanding, the Messiah would be the one, like David, who would come and make Israel a great nation, would raise it up, but Jesus doesn't do that. In fact, never once does he declare himself as king. Pilate says to him, you are a king, and all he says, you say so. This was deeply problematic for those Jewish people. Because the one that they had imagined was one that would rule and conquer the world. Yet all Jesus does is humbles himself and takes on the form of a slave and dies on the cross. 
What sort of king is that? You think we Christians would get it, but over 2,000 years, we've continually perpetuated this myth that Jesus is king and that he's come to rule the world and that all our countries are to be empires and to rule with power and might. But not so. I think this feast day is a day for us to be challenged and that we need to look carefully at who Jesus reveals himself to be. Not a ruler with might. He doesn't raise up an army to conquer and to impose his reign. Rather, he simply empties himself gives of himself as a gift to the people. In Jesus' act of suffering and dying for us, we actually see the kingdom of God. We experience what it is that we too are called to be, to be gift for all God's people. Jesus' suffering and death on the cross actually reveals the very heart of God. His entire ministry reveals God's desire that all may have life and have it to the full. And that God will do whatever God can do so that you and I can have life and live that here and now. That's the joy. Our God is a God who desires for us to have life not to impose burdens upon us, not to make us suffer, but a God who wants to lift us up and raise us. And this God too turns to us and says, I want you to give yourself as gift to others as I have given myself as gift to you. This is the point of the Last Supper. John, who declares Jesus as king, is also the one who shows Jesus getting down on his hands and knees and washing the feet of his disciples and telling us we must do the same. If you want to know what it means to be a Christian, it means to imitate Jesus. To do just this, not to rule the world with might, but to get down on our hands and knees and to love one another as Christ has loved us. To give ourselves as total and complete gift for others. Not to be motivated by selfish desires or wants, but to be motivated by a genuine interest in the good of all God's people. And this is a task for us, not just as individuals, but as a church as well. The other night during our Vex the Vicar, we talked a little bit about how God is calling the church to conversion. See, far too long in the church, we wanted to play the political role. We wanted to be the ones front and center. But I think it's actually a gift in recent years that God has stripped the church of her might and power and has made us less than before. Because I think God is trying to push us and say, no, live the way of love. Live this life that Jesus shows. Not to power and might, but live as humble servants for all. And so now we look and we begin to ask ourselves, how do we use the resources that we have so that they can be gifts, help others have life to the full? This week, I've also been reading a lot about our parish history. And over the past 150 years, there have been several pivotal moments where the parish has had to make a decision of how it was going to live its baptismal vocation to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. 
And something stood out to me in that history is that there were a couple of key moments where the parish had to decide, does it continue on the way it always has, or does it imagine itself anew? Ironically, you and I are standing in a building which was a result of that first endeavor. Canon Ski wanted very much for the church to move beyond denominational groupings. In fact, he was famous for inviting preachers from other traditions into this church, but more so, what I read, is that he chose this Byzantine architecture because it did not connect itself to the denominations of the day. Church of England people were famous for English Gothic, Roman Catholics for Baroque, but he went back further in history and wanted to make a church that reflected more of that early church, a church for all, not the Church of England, not the Anglican Church, but the church for all God's people. In fact, this architecture is important because the focus isn't necessarily on the altar. The focus is actually the entire people of God living in God's reign. All of us share in the ministry of Jesus Christ. And Kaninsky was intentional about that. We often talk about Canon George Young. He too saw the need for the church to rethink her resources. He saw too the need that we had to care for the most vulnerable among us. And so we have St. Anne's place. Our rectory was torn down and something else was born. We now stand at another pivotal moment. We can continue on as we always have, or we can look around us and say, how is God calling us to be servants and to use our gifts for the good of the people around us here and now? And this is a painful conversation because ultimately it has meant that we have to sell our church hall. And that is not easy. Wonderful, amazing memories have been made in that place. But we have to be like Jesus, to let go, to strip ourselves bare, and to kneel down and serve God's beloved. Over the coming weeks and year, this is going to be our focus. How do we reimagine our ministry as serving the people of God, the most vulnerable among us? And that's going to demand of us a long vision, not to immediate gains, but to look ahead and imagine what this place can be. And that's why we read Revelation today, by the way. Revelation acknowledges that the reign of God has begun, but it is not yet consummated. Instead, we are in the process of a new birth. And you and I are invited by Jesus to share in his ministry, to proclaim justice, peace, mercy, love, and kindness. Then God's reign can prevail. But for us to do that, we have to turn to the one who gave himself as gift to us. We have to turn to Jesus to meditate upon his life, to imitate it in our actions, and to let others see not us and our wishes, but the will of the one who loved us, 
Jesus Christ. Amen.